assuming most of you are completely unfamiliar with the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> you have never heard. <laughs> so most of you are, this is a Bhakti Shastra level class. So there is a basic level of familiarity. Now, if we look at the Bhagavad Gita itself, from the Gita's perspective, what is its purpose? What is the purpose of Krishna in speaking the Bhagavad Gita? What do you think? How to live, how to let go and how to love. That's a beautiful presentation of the purpose. <laughs> Maybe I can give a class on that sometime. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, but let's look at the context of the Bhagavad Gita. Whom is Krishna speaking to? Arjuna. Arjuna. And why is he speaking the Bhagavad Gita? To remove the illusion of Arjuna. Okay, what was the... To make Arjuna to fight. Okay, so yes, to remove the illusion of Arjuna so that Arjuna could take the right decision. So when Krishna starts speaking the Bhagavad Gita, at one level, the Gita is just a natural conversation between friends. Hmm. Krishna is of course God, but he's... Oh, I'm getting an echo, echo here, Prabhu. Hmm. It's a natural conversation between friends. And that's why it is, you could say now in contemporary language, it's like a podcast. It's not like a class. A podcast is more like a free-flowing discussion. There is, a, there is some structure to it. But it is not... Again, a class is like a teacher comes with a plan. I'm going to speak this point, this point, this point, this point. But the Gita is, is a discussion. It's a serious discussion. But it's a discussion. And whatever point comes up, that point is addressed. So Krishna speaks a particular point and Arjuna gets a question. And then Arjuna, in answering Arjuna's question, Krishna takes a, uh, takes, a, takes a discussion in a particular direction. So it's more like a podcast discussion. Hmm? Not a pre-planned class. And what is the reason for understanding, for emphasizing this point is, Unmute. <coughs> so, we want the audio to go from here alone. Yeah. Okay. Because I muted myself so that it is not recorded. So now, when Krishna is speaking in this way, the reason why I am emphasizing this is that Krishna does not start off with the intention of analyzing various paths. It's Arjuna has a decision to make and Krishna is guiding Arjuna to make a decision. So to give another example to illustrate this point is, say suppose we have a doctor-patient discussion. And say the patient has some severe illness and the doctor is guiding the patient okay what treatment what treatment options are there for you so at that time the doctor may analyze allopathy ayurveda naturopathy yunani whatever kind of treatments might be there but the doctor is not giving a structured class on each of these disciplines the purpose is not to educate the patient about these various treatments in general. It is specifically to help the patient decide what treatment I am going to take. So from that perspective, it's about treatment options. So it's not that in such a discussion, the doctor will give a technical definition of Ayurveda, a technical definition of allopathy, 
a technical definition of naturopathy no okay allopathy involves this 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 and these are the pros these are the cons like that so similarly when krishna is talking about the various parts in the bhagavad gita his purpose is not so much to analyze the parts and that's why you will see that there is no like a clear one sentence definition of necessarily of karma yoga or of bhakti yoga or gyan yoga there are descriptions of this but the gita's purpose is not a technical description of these processes so because of this krishna analyzes these various parts to the extent that is relevant in arjuna's decision making process so the purpose of the gita in that sense is to guide arjuna mm -hmm. the purpose is to guide arjuna to take a sound decision and from that perspective krishna analyzes various parts so we will be talking because when we talk about the progression we'll actually talk about the various yogas and the yoga ladder but krishna does not necessarily go into a technical analysis okay this is this yoga and this is what this is what this contains it's not a technical analysis he describes different yogas to some extent just like a uh, doctor suppose somebody has cancer and he say okay you do allopathy you are going to do chemotherapy this is what it will involve if you take radiotherapy this is what it will involve so like that it's it's a, it's some description is there what is relevant to the patient so and krishna is not even starting with various yogas it's not that krishna says okay now i am going to describe karma yoga there are some places where krishna says now i'll talk about the modes now i'll talk about action in terms of the modes or whatever there are some places where krishna mentions specifically i am going to do that but krishna doesn't specifically say that this is what i am going to do because it's a natural conversation and so let's see krishna's purpose is to get arjuna to do to to guide arjuna toward the right decision and generally when we are trying to guide somebody to the right decision we start with what are the options so let's begin with that so why does krishna even discuss the yoga paths that's what we will discuss so if we begin from arjuna's perspective arjuna's options that is basically he, how he sees his options to be arjuna is not really con concerned about karma yoga or dhyan yoga is concerned about only two options fight or don't fight and he starts with the intention to fight that's why he blows his conch right in the beginning panch janyam rishi kesho devadattam dhananjaya paundram dadma maha shankham vima karma vrkodara so maha shankham no oh, that's what the was what the sound tumulo abhinunade they all blow the conch but it is said that krishna and arjuna blow the first song first conch so krishna is arjuna is initially ready to fight but then when he sees the warriors he starts thinking maybe i should not fight and this decision fight or not fight arjuna is not simply seeing it in terms of his situations he broadens his understanding and he thinks a fight is the path of action hmm? and don't fight is the path of renunciation so essentially krishna arjuna is thinking in this of these two options and he thinks that okay this looks like we but i am using it as greater than hmm so it's not a victory if you see the we to be victory <laughs> so arjuna sees that this path is actually the path of renunciation is better and that's why he think maybe i should just renounce the world uh but now when krishna is describing krishna is responding to arjuna at that time krishna tells arjuna that the options are not so simple hmm? 
So this is till now what you discussed. Arjuna's vision of his options. Mm -hmm. this, this is what he thinks his options are. But what is Krishna's description? If you put it. That Krishna says actually your options are not two but four. What are those four options? He says action can be at two levels. Let me make it long. And renunciation can be at two levels. So action can be attached action. Attached or selfish action. And conversely action can be detached action. And then similarly renunciation can be internalized renunciation. That means actually one has developed the spirit of renunciation. And the other can be simply externalized renunciation. And not simply using the word external over here. Externalized means that externally one has renounced. But whether internally one has developed renunciation or not, that is debatable. Now, if you consider these four options, which, one, which ones do you think Krishna recommends and which ones Krishna does not recommend? Okay, so detached action Krishna does recommend, okay? And externalized renunciation? No. Internalized renunciation? Yes. Attached action? Well, okay, it's not the worst thing, but it is not the best thing. So we could put a question mark over here. Now, so in general, We'll come back to this table again, but education, <coughs> education often has two stages to it. Could say many, but two stages. The first is that <coughs> what seems simple, show how it is complex. You say, why should you do that? Because Suppose somebody thinks it's only black and white. But reality is not always black and white. So you have to show that there are shades of grey. So many times education means we have to show people things are not as simple as they seem. Somebody may say, oh you know, you you recommended this treatment because you know you will get a you will get a commission from the doctor over there. Or you get recognition from that hospital. Okay, maybe. But it might not be that. Maybe this is because, you know, if something goes wrong, I can be of help to you. Now, if you go somewhere else, I cannot, if any complication happens, I cannot be of help to you. There could be many reasons why something is done. So, so when a person does not have sufficient education, it's very easy to see things in terms of black and white. But education often reveals to us that the reality is complex. So first step in education often is to reveal the complexity in what seems simple. But eventually, there is also another phase. We, from the complex, we should also be able to go to the simple. That means that, okay, life, there are many complicated things, but actually, this is how you can go ahead. So somebody should, be a really good person, a well-educated, a good teacher should also be able to make things simple. They only make it complicated and leave it at that. It's like sometimes you hear a class, you go to hear a class because you want answers to questions. And at the end of the class, you have more questions than you have answers. <laughs> Not only more questions than answers, you had more questions than you had before the start of the class. <laughs> That is certainly not the best education. Okay, there is, see, there is one thing which is curiosity. 
I say, what I learned makes sense, but I would like to learn more. And there is another that is confusion. So a good session, a good class should trigger, should result in what? Curiosity. Hey, this made so much sense. How much more is there to learn over here? I would like to learn that. So that's how a good education, it should lead, good education of any kind, should lead to curiosity. Curiosity is, I want to learn more. But confusion is, I can't make sense of anything. What I thought I knew, now I don't know at all. So, sometimes some teachers take pleasure in just showing the students how ignorant they are. Or, not just how ignorant they are, how what they thought they knew was wrong. Okay, that might be a part of it. Sometimes we have to uh, correct people's conceptions, misconceptions, preconceptions, whatever. But at the end of it, we, should, we don't want people to stay insecure. Is it? Okay, I learned something and I would like to learn something more. Yes. Otherwise, so curiosity is that I learned something and I want to learn something more now. Confusion is, you know, I don't even know what I know. It's, it's very insecure. So we don't want that. So going back, so there are shades of grey that is complex. But within that, simple means that there is some recommendation. There is some choice. So for example, I mean a doctor is recommending treatment. Doctor may say, okay, you know, these are those options, these are these options, these are options for you. And these are the pros and cons, these are the pros and cons. Now at the end, the doctor gives say four treatment options and all their pros and cons. And now you decide. Really? I have to decide now. Then we may say, okay, that's a bit too much. So doctor, we may ask, okay, what is your recommendation? So, I'll come to this part of making the complex simple as we come to the end of the Gita. But the point I'm making here is, Krishna is here showing the complexity within the symbol. That there are four kinds. Not just two options, there are four. And it's not necessary that renunciation is better than action. Because externalized renunciation, only externalized, you could call it an artificial renunciation, a false renunciation. That is the that could be the worst. So if you say in terms of priorities, in terms of hierarchy, you could say this is the four, three, and then the way Krishna goes is two and one. That means Krishna recommends detached action is the most important. But he says internal renunciation is also good. Hmm? Internalized renunciation, there is outer renunciation is there, but the outer renunciation is accompanied by internal renunciation. So now, when Krishna is giving these options, at that time, so he now places these options in terms of various paths. So here there is a, you could say the third stage comes in. He puts these options in terms of broader paths. So attached action is which path? Karma Kanda. Isn't it? When somebody is doing attached action, that is generally Karma Kanda. You could say it's at a very short term level, it's Indra Dukti. It's not even Karma Kanda. It's like, I have something to enjoy, I just enjoy it. Karma Kanda is, okay, let me do some rituals by that is Dharma, then I get Artha and Kama. That is Karma Kanda. If somebody just wants Artha and Kama or just wants Kama, then that is just Indra Dukti. Now that is not enough. That is just sense gratification. That is not what Arjuna is thinking also at all. So that's karma kant. Now merely externalized renunciation, Krishna doesn't recommend that at all. Now internalized renunciation means yes, there is external renunciation, but there is internal also. For this, Krishna talks about two paths. That is, dhyan yoga and jnana yoga. Hmm? And for detached action, Krishna talks about two paths. Karma Yoga and Bhakti Yoga. So, now it is here that Krishna starts introducing the various paths and analyzing Arjuna's options in terms of the various paths. 
it's like suppose i'm sick and okay i have some fever and uh, i put some what is that you take some salt and some warm warm cloth you put it with some salt or something like that you may say oh that's a part of naturopathy i might be doing that i didn't know it is a part of naturopathy or if your stomach is upset we take some some substances we may take aula for health and say oh that's a part of ayurveda i didn't know it's a part of ayurveda i'm just doing it already but then then you put it in broader terms so like that krishna is putting the options in broader terms so when krishna is analyzing these various parts so i'm now concluding the purpose section krishna's purpose is to guide arjuna toward the right action so we have this if you consider a target mm. Mm. the colloquial word for target is bullseye now i find it a very cruel word is <laughs> it <laughs> to hurt a bull is bad to hurt a bull in the eye it's the most vulnerable part so as well you use the word target now if somebody is a good archer and they can hit an arrow and hit the target straight you know hey that's impressive that's great isn't it so now if somebody could hit the target from multiple directions then that would be even more impressive isn't it not just from the straight front but from various sides you can hit the target so what krishna does in the bhagavad gita is krishna has one target that arjuna should fight so krishna analyzes the various parts in such a way that the conclusion is that arjuna fights so krishna analyzes from the path of perspective of karma kanda and he says you should fight krishna analyzes from the perspective of karma yoga and he says you should fight krishna analyzes from the perspective of bhakti yoga and he says you should fight krishna analyzes from the perspective of dhyan yoga and he arrives at the same conclusion you should fight krishna arrives analyzes from the perspective of gyan yoga and he also arrives at the same conclusion so that is the brilliance of krishna in the bhagavad gita that he takes various paths but the practical call for action for arjuna is that he should fight now now how does he do that if he says gyan yoga and dhyan yoga that might seem a little more difficult because these are paths of renunciation so how would krishna do that and that's what we will discuss as we move forward how krishna analyzes those paths but the first section is in terms of purpose krishna is to summarize krishna doesn't start out analyzing various paths krishna's purpose is to guide arjuna towards the right choice and for guiding him krishna gets into the analysis of various paths okay so now we move to the second part that is the progression progression is how does the gita's thought flow progress so krishna starts with arjuna and where he is so if we look at first fight fight or we can call it action so there he analyzes that in two terms karma kanda and karma yoga so in both of these karma kanda he analyzes from 231 to 37 and karma yoga he analyzes from to there's a transition to the two verse which are transition verse 38 39 and 240 to 53 that is where he analyzes karma yoga mm-hmm. and krishna he says if you are doing karma kanda then hato va prapsisi swargam jitva va bhukshise mai tasmat uttishta kaunteya yuddhaya krut nischaya so he concludes arjuna should fight because if you die you will go attain heaven if you win you will get the earth therefore there is no loss for you at all 
if however you do not if you decide not to fight then you will lose in this world you will gain infamy and in the next world you will have committed sinful activity so you will you will get hell so here the karma kanda krishna uses to analyze that you should fight and then krishna moves to the next level and karma yoga he says that if you act as is your duty without being worried about the result without being fixated on the results then that very detachment will take you towards liberation karmanne vadikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana he says without considering the results sukhe dukhe samay krutva labha labhau jaya jayu tatto yuddhai jasva naivam papam avapsisi so in this way you will not get entangled this is what krishna analyzes in terms of karma yoga now after this arjuna asks questions in one sense by 253 the bhagavad gita could have got over krishna didn't even have to teach bhagavad uh, teach bhakti yoga at all krishna could have completed it and arjuna said okay therefore i should fight but arjuna gets questions you are talking about this this you know giving up giving up uh, abominable activities avaram karma so he said you know you will attain you will attain peace you will become detached from the world so what are the characteristics of such a person arjuna asks so we are not going to go into the entire flow of the gita but 2.54 arjuna asks that's why krishna describes the sita pragya section and that sita pragya section so when that finishes then krishna repeats repeatedly uses the word shanti shanti madhi gachati 272 271 both of these verses have the word shanti apurya manam achala pratishtham samudra maapah pravishanti atva tadvat kamayam pravishanti sarve sa shanti maapnoti na kama kami and then again vihaya kamanya sarvan pumam sharat nispruha nirmamo nirahankara sa shanti madhi gachati so krishna is talking about internal peace that one will get when one works with detachment but arjuna is thinking if krishna shanti is the goal then why are you telling me to fight <laughs> so what happens is that whenever we are speaking the generally the audience gets 20% of what the speaker is speaking and god knows which 20% it is <laughs> <laughs> so arjuna catches those words shanti he says if you want shanti then why are you telling me to fight and then krishna says okay let's now take a step back i'll do a systematic analysis that's why in arjuna's question is 3.1 and 2 krishna says lokesmin vividha nishta pura prokta mayanaka so he said there are two levels the level of action and there's a level of renunciation and then krishna says that if there is if there is premature renunciation is only externalized renunciation then that is counterproductive that is something which you should not do so basically when krishna moves forward in these options okay so then krishna when krishna goes forward here he introduces okay here he introduces this <coughs> this particular option that which is artificial renunciation or we could call it more externalized or premature renunciation and premature renunciation he says definitely don't do this this is a three from 3.3 to 9 here we have the verse karmendriyani sanyamya yasate manasa smaran indriyarthan vimudatma mithyachara sa uchyate and such a person is a mithyachari is a hypocrite a very strong word it's one of the strongest words that krishna uses in the bhagavad gita mudha is there but if you look at if you know a little bit of sanskrit language and look at the gradations of words like in english there are many negative words that was foolish that was stupid that was idiotic that was ridiculous you know each of these words they are similar but they are not exactly similar now if i say okay they are foolish ridiculous idiotic i said that's monstrous now that's a completely different is it it's very it's a negative word but there's a different degree to it so mithyachara has a very much stronger connotation than mudha hmm? mudha is foolish mithyachara is more of deceptive it's like mudha is i am fooling myself 
But with Tya Chai Rice, I am deliberately trying to fool someone else. So it's a very strongly Krishna approaches that. And then Krishna moves forward to analyze. Again, he analyzes Karma Kanda. He says, okay, now I'll talk about various levels to you. So this, what is not to be done, I clearly first explain that. Then 3.9 to 3.16, again Krishna talks about Karma Kanda. This is where we have the verses that uh, Devan Bhavetani na Deva Bhavayantu. That you satisfy the Devata, the Devata satisfy us. And then we move forward. And then, in one sense, Krishna goes to one level higher. He says, the highest level, the highest level is what? Ex internalized renunciation or mature renunciation. So he says, even if you are ready to renounce the world, if you are fit enough to renounce the world, then to you personally, it won't make any difference whether you are in the world or whether you are outside the world. Because you are renounced, you are not attached, you are not going to be entangled. But it will make a difference to the world. That if you renounce, you may be renouncing because you are detached. But people will think you are renouncing because you had a difficult choice. And that's why you renounce. So in future, when people have difficult duties to do, they will just renounce it. And then that's how society will uh, society will be misled. It like suppose there's a police person and they, they are from a particular community. And maybe the members from that community are rioting. They say, No, I don't want to I don't want to attack them. It's a reasonable thing. But he says, and that's when they resign from it. Then that would mean that actually you didn't want to attack them. But maybe that person is already thinking of giving up the job. Maybe they have near retirement age. There could be many reasons. But people will take it as an excuse that whenever there's a difficult duty, just give it up. So for setting an example for others, even if you are renounced, act at the pre... You, you are qualified enough to renounce the world. Stay engaged in the world. So... In one sense, with respect to the path of renunciation, Krishna does not reproach those paths. But he says, it is better for the world, for setting the example in the world, that you act at in the engaged level. And that is why Krishna talks about the difference in the third chapter. So mature renunciation, this is what Krishna largely analyzes from 317 till 335 roughly. This is where he analyzes the difference between somebody who is internally attached and somebody who is internally attached. So even if you are detached, still you act in the world. And that's how it moves on forward. So like that, the analysis goes on. Now, this is just a sample. We, just, we discussed three chapters right now. And that also it is much more in broad terms. I cannot go over all the 18 chapters. But let's understand in broad terms only what is happening. So, we know that the Gita has how many chapters? 18. 18 chapters, yes. And these 18 chapters are conventionally said to have a division. What is the division? What do each of these uh, quad... Yeah. Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga and Jnana Yoga. And that is more or less universal. It is not just we are saying it. Anybody who reads the chapters... Just translations we read, we see that's a particular focus. Now, if we look at it internally, in terms of flow, it's more like if we consider Karma Yoga, um, Gyan Yoga and Bhakti Yoga. So, the first six chapters are actually a progression from Karma Yoga to Bhakti Yoga. And it goes from Karma Yoga through Dhyan Yoga to Bhakti Yoga. Hmm? The middle six chapters, they discuss broadly Bhakti Yoga itself. And the last six chapters, they are actually a progression from Gyan Yoga to Bhakti Yoga. So in this way, what Krishna is doing is that he while in terms of practical call for action, he's saying that you have to fight. But the consciousness with which you fight, 
that will vary if somebody is practicing karma yoga somebody is practicing is thinking that dhyan yoga is to be practiced or bhakti yoga is to be practiced so from whichever path arjuna practices the point is he should act and fight but krishna analyzes it from different perspectives so by the time the fifth chapter comes krishna has analyzed and said that okay arjuna you should practice karma yoga but then arjuna has this question there are some questions in the gita which arjuna articulates explicitly does anyone know how many questions are there in the bhagavad gita no five oh you are not giving due credit to arjuna <laughs> Uh, Arjuna is much more of an involved and participatory listener. So, any idea? We can count. We can count, okay? <laughs> so there's two in chapter two. Yeah. So there are totally seventeen questions in the Bhagavad Gita. Hmm? There are seventeen questions by Arjuna, and at the end there is one question by Krishna. Like at the end of a class, a teacher asks, "Are there any questions?" <laughs> <laughs> so Arjuna is asked by Krishna, "Have you heard attentively?" Kachchi deta chutam partha toy eka gre na chita sa. Kachchi da gyana sammoha pranastas te dhananjay. This is 1872. Now, of course, there is one question right in the beginning by the Trashta. And we don't like him, so we'll cancel it. <laughs> <laughs> so now that question is broadly the same question that is the driving question of the Mahabharata. The whole Mahabharata is a question to understand what is dharma, what is the right thing to do. and that is what dharma kshetra kuru kshetra that starts with dharma so he is asking what did they do but indirectly it's a question about dharma and dharma kshetra so that is more of a contextual question it's not a philosophical question that's why it's not because we don't like him but it's not central to the analytical flow of the gita so in general the when the gita flows forward the gita's flow is it can now we are discussing second section about the gita's flow or the gita's progression so when krishna is speaking that raises certain questions in arjuna's mind and arjuna answers krishna answers those questions some questions krishna hears arjuna articulate and then krishna answers those questions but sometimes sometimes when you are giving a class you know people ask questions and sometimes people's face is a question <laughs> is it so some question is so evident it's then say for example if i'm giving a class right now and i say to so okay so today i will give a class on the on shankaracharya's advaitic commentary called charitaka bhasya <laughs> okay Allah will get a question. Hey, why are we discussing Shankara Charya's commentary? And if you don't have a question, then I will have a big question. <laughs> why don't you have a question? <laughs> so, Arjuna, by the end of the fifth chapter, when Krishna has conclusively more or less established Karma Yoga, that this is what Arjuna you should do. Arjuna has a question, but then isn't there any place for renunciation at all? I see there are so many renowned sages, and they are so respected. So, isn't there a place for renunciation? And that's how Krishna goes into Dhyan Yoga. Yes, there is a place for renunciation, and that's when Krishna describes the entire process of Dhyan Yoga in the sixth chapter, in summary. And then Arjuna himself says that, okay, this this process requires a very calm mind. Samyena Madhusudana. So one to five is an establishment of karma yoga. But then after that, Krishna talks about in the fifth chapter 
he six chapter, uh, chapter six he talks about dhyan yoga but then he says dhyan yoga requires a very great peace of mind equanimity of the mind what is 6.9 suhrun mitrar yudasina madhyastha dvesh bandhushu sadhushu api cha papeshu samabuddhir vishishyate to see everyone equally that equal vision towards everyone krishna talks about this this equal vision in 6.9 he also talks about in 6.32 atma upamena sarvat atma upamena sarvatra samam pasyati arjuna sukham va yadi va dukham sayogi parmo mata and is this point arjuna says hey no equal vision is not possible for me how can i see somebody is a virtu- virtuous like yudhishthir and somebody vicious like duryodhan equally well if you are really to renounce the world you should be able to see like that so how can we see that so the dualities are there in the world there could be a virtuous person who always does good things and there's a vicious person how can we see them equally it's only when one has got some level of realization that even if good people do good things or bad people do bad things the world is going to go in its own way the world is dukhale and everybody is going through janm to jaragati now for most people it is very difficult to have this vision and especially for kshatriya kshatriya who wants to fix things you know kshatriya are meant to be in one sense they are fixers this is the problem fix it organize society in such a way that people's welfare is taken care of so arjuna says i can't have this vision arjuna is very candid and krishna says okay so that's why when arjuna says my mind is very restless chanchal bhi mana krishna now it's not that if we literally take that verse to apply to arjuna he says my mind arjuna is chanchal bhi pramathi balavartu we might say hey, better you get admitted into the mental health care center he <laughs> said so arjuna is overall been a very stable person so he's talking specifically if i try to see yudhishthir and duryodhan equally i cannot my mind will go wild at that so if we cannot see beyond duality then we are not yet ready to renounce the world so if we feel a strong urge to fix to fix things in the world you know this is good this is bad and i would try to decrease the bad and bring about the good then that means we need to engage in the world now does that mean that those who are renounced they don't care for the world no it's not like that there are these dualities of the world and all this is at the material level and then this is at the spiritual level so those who are renunciates no they are themselves going here and they don't really care whether somebody is going is going from here to here or they're going from here to here they say whether you are in the happiness or in distress the point is you have to rise beyond both but as long as happiness and distress really matter to us then but happiness and distress in the world matter to us then that is not yet a vision suited for renunciation and that is why in our bhakti tradition also we have uttam adhikaris have to come down to madhyam adhikaris if if say there is some natural disaster and say thousands of people are killed right now or say hamas has committed atrocities in israel and say okay this world is a place of distress and death everybody is going to die one day so what is the big deal well people say, what's wrong with you are you crazy so we cannot bring that vision we'll have to bring a vision of compassion over there isn't it so maybe that is philosophically true but that's also a question which we can't explore here Arjuna says, "I cannot do this." Krishna says, "Okay, then, therefore, there is an alternative path for you." So Arjuna asks some questions. Krishna answers those questions, and Krishna here he goes to after the Han Yoga, there is Bhakti Yoga. That Bhakti Yoga is Yogi Nama Pi Sarveshya Madgatena Antaratmana. 
that among all the yogis, one who constantly meditates on me within the heart, that is the highest. And so, the perfection of Bhakti Yoga, Krishna says, is to fix one's mind on Krishna. And then, Krishna says, so if we consider that through this whole process of Karma Yoga, through Dhyan Yoga to Bhakti Yoga, one has come. And the essence of Bhakti Yoga is mind absorbed in Krishna. Mm -hmm. It's not, see generally say fix the mind on Krishna means that is more of effort. But absorbed in Krishna means it's natural. And then Krishna says, now I will tell you another path by which you can absorb your mind in me. Mai asakta manaha. That destination of making the mind attached to me, how can you do that? Touch Shrunu. That's what Krishna was describing in 7.1. And that is where Krishna starts describing Bhakti Yoga. And then he describes how Bhakti Yoga can be started by, by anyone from anywhere. That's why Chaturvidha Bhajante Ma. That was come. That four kinds of people come to me. Then there are still people who might not take this path also. That is Namam, Dushkriti, No Mood, all that is there. So the middle six chapters are more or less a description of Bhakti Yoga with in the middle six chapters many things are happening but mainly three things are happening here. First is Krishna compares Bhakti Yoga with Dhyan Yoga. Especially he does this in chapter 8. And he says Tasyaham Sulabha Partha that's 8.14. Arjuna has said that this is very difficult to do. That Dushprapit, dush, that. that is very difficult. Vayoriva Dushkaram. That is difficult, Krishna says. But no, if you fix the mind on me, it is easy. Tasyaham Sulabha Partha. And then Krishna goes on describing Bhakti itself. And while describing Bhakti, he describes his own glories. Because the point is, if we want to practice Bhakti, we need to know uh, about the person to whom we are becoming devoted. And that's why in the first six chapters, Krishna doesn't talk much about himself. Because when he's teaching Karma Yoga, he does, in Karma Yoga, the focus is more on detachment. It's not so much on God. That's why in the first six chapters, Krishna doesn't talk much about himself. And then he describes his own glories to some extent in the seventh chapter, to some extent in the ninth chapter. And then, 10.11. In one sense, here, the Bhagavad Gita is over. That Krishna has spoken the Chatur Shloki Gita from 10.8 to 11. And then, after that, Arjuna speaks his own words. He speaks from 12 to 18. And there he says, Krishna Param Brahma Param Dhamma. So this is Chatur Shloki Gita. And that is like, a, once, suppose somebody is giving a summary. This is the essence. That means, when will you summarize the class? When more or less the class is over, isn't it? So, and after that, an Arjuna is speaking. Now, Arjuna's words initially are about, yes, I ex you are the Supreme Lord. I accept everything that you say. That what you have said has been said by, said by sages like Deval and Asit also. And then he says, only you can know yourself in full. Soyam evat manatmanam vittatvam purushottama. That you alone can know yourself in full. And in this way, here you could say by 15th verse, Arjuna has accepted Krishna as the supreme reality. And then we could say that means whatever Krishna does Arjuna, Arjuna will do that. So at this point, we could say, if we consider the Gita to be a, a main class. See, generally what happens is, if a speaker is giving a class, then, then sometimes within the class, there might be some question answers. Mm -hmm. And so after the class, there can be some question answers. So, at this point, or the next point I'll explain. At this point, 10-15, you could say, Arjuna, Arjuna has understood it. Krishna supremacy. Then, but Arjuna asks then, okay, you have told me to fix the mind on you, but I have to fight in this world. So while fighting, how can I fix the mind on you? Therefore, keshu keshu cha bhaveshu chintyo si bhagavan maya. 
how can I remember you in this world? And therefore, from that 18th verse, from around 20th verse onwards, till the end, 42, Krishna talks about his Vibhuti. Vibhuti is where everything opulent that you see in this world, you can understand that is my promise. So, if you see on the battlefield, you will see Bhishma's excellent archery. You will see Drona's expertise. You will see even Karana's expertise in archery. You will see these as my opulences. When you see their excellence, remember me. So remembering God doesn't mean just okay turning away from the world and meditating. Yeah, that is there. But when we are acting in the world, when we see, so we might be good singers, but we see some devotee who sings very nicely. We can become jealous, you know, why is this devotee singing so nicely? Why this devotee, why are people appreciating this devotee more than me? Or we can see, actually, when I sing nicely, it is Krishna manifesting an opulence through me. And when this devotee is singing nicely, Krishna is manifesting an opulence through this devotee. So, rather than thinking that, why are more people being attracted to this devotee? We should be thinking, how can I be more attracted to Krishna? So if I'm Krishna conscious, then I'll see, okay, Krishna's opulence is manifesting to this person and I'll be able to remember. But the purpose of Vibhuti discussion is to help Arjuna to remember Krishna in the world. And then, you could say in chapter 11, here, the first four verses that Arjuna speaks, 11, 1 to 4, but the first one or two verses, it's more or less similar to 11.1 and 2. They are actually similar to the conclusion. 1873 he says, Nashto moha tat two, two things he talks about. I have free from illusion and it is by your mercy. Now in 11.1 and 2, Arjuna says the same thing actually. Yatoyoktam vachastena moho yam vigato mama. Moho yam vigato mama. Mad anugraha ya parmam. Mad anugraha. So anugraha is the same as mercy. So in both of these verses, Krishna is talking, Arjuna, Arjuna is talking about freedom from illusion. And he is talking, it has happened by mercy. By your, in Krishna's mercy. So in one sense, at this point, the Bhagavad Gita is over. Hmm? Arjuna has also understood that Krishna is God, whatever Krishna tells me, I should be doing this. So, in one sense, from here onwards, the questions that come, they are like supplementary questions after the class. So, whenever there are questions, the questions could be based, related to the class, and broadly, they could be related to the topic, even if not directly to the class. So if they are in, during the flow of the class, the questions are there, then at that time you will want to know, okay, okay, why did you get this question now? Oh, you made that point just, oh, okay, this question is related to this point. But if at the end of the class, somebody is asking a question, those questions may not necessarily be related to any of the points in the class specific. They could be about the broad subject that is discussed. So that is why in one sense, in chapter 11, when Arjuna asks about the show me the Virat Rupa. Now we could relate that with the last verse 10.42. But Athava bahunaitena kimyatena tava Arjuna. But still, it's, it's a supplementary question. And even if we accept that, in the next chapter, 12th chapter, when Arjuna is asking a question, that which is better, personal or impersonal. Now that has no relation with anything that is spoken in the 11th chapter. And then after that, the 13th chapter, when Arjuna asks, Kshetra and Kshetra, you know, that not only has no relation, Arjuna has not, Krishna has not even used those words. <laughs> Isn't it? Kshetra for example, is a very specific word. Krishna doesn't use it anywhere in the Bhagavad Gita. So why is Arjuna asking these questions? Because now Krishna has given Arjuna a whole world view and a, Krishna, a whole spiritual world view and Arjuna is saying, I know certain things from the past. What I know from the past, how does it fit within this world view? 
it like suppose uh, the doctor tells us what a particular way the body works and the body heals and we normally may thinking that okay you know you eat eat food periodically and that's how you become healthy the doctor says actually you fast the more you fast the healthier you become hey how does that work i thought the body requires nutrition if you're not eating how you going to win and they say okay this is how it works but what about this what about that so those questions may not be directly related but but the point is within okay I, this is the world view you are given how does this information that i have fit into that world view so you could say from chapter 11 onward it's more the gita is driven by arjuna's questions so like after a class at the end of a class when there are question answers there may not be any question any relation between first question and second question now we could say i said earlier the gita is not like a class i said it's like a podcast <laughs> so then why am i talking in the example of class but the point is even within a podcast the speaker may have a particular message to give it may not be like a structured message but the speaker has a particular message to give so that message in general is completed by the 10th chapter end mm -hmm. now from the 11th chapter everything that goes on is by arjuna's questions and specifically when arjuna in 13.1 ask questions now he asks about six terms kshetra kshetra gya gyan agya purusha prakriti now arjuna when he asks these terms about these terms krishna may say you know this is the battlefield is not the place to expand your vocabulary <laughs> why are you trying to ex why are you asking these terms so those terms are associated with the world view so krishna when he is asked about those terms so the question the question about terms is it's not a question about vocabulary it's a question about the world view that is associated with those terms and that world view is the world view of gyana and that is why from the 13th chapter krishna starts going into the analysis of gyan yoga so from the 13th chapter it starts with gyan yoga analysis and then it culminates in bhakti yoga so i won't go into the flow of this chapters it was these are because it's gyana it requires a lot of gyana mm -hmm. <laughs> so we'll just move towards the conclusion so here krishna introduces the concepts of the three modes and then he uses the modes to analyze arjuna's options and in one sense arjuna by that 18th chapter it's more or less he has come to the conclusion mm -hmm. and in 18.1 when arjuna asks a question that is more or less similar to the question that he has asked earlier 2.7 3.1 2 5.1 essentially the same question should i act should i fight or should i not fight should i act or should i renounce he is asking about tyaga and sanyasa tatvam ichhami veditum so now krishna could have said i have already answered this are you so dumb you forgot or sometimes you know sometimes the speaker is asked the same question uh, which they have already answered and the speaker repeats exactly the same answer that in the same person i asked the same question a second time and the speaker answers gives the same answer the second time then the question i say you know my hearing is not the problem isn't it i heard you previously but what you said didn't make sense what you so a good if this good speaker if the same question is asked asked a second time they will answer it from a different perspective so okay if this didn't become clear from this analysis let's analyze from a different perspective so 
towards the end krishna integrates and a better speaker even more he say at the start of a class there was a question and there's an answer given at that time and then after that there was some development of subject in the class and then again at the end of the class same question comes up then an expert speaker will not only answer from a different perspective but will the expert speaker will include the concept that were discussed and developed in the class to into that perspective so while analyzing what is better action or renunciation krishna actually integrates the concept of the modes and that's what is in the first half of the 18th chapter he talks about this work in the three modes worker in the three modes there is buddhi in the three modes there is jnana in the three modes and then he moves forward to from karma yoga then he talks briefly about gyan yoga and so for example in this chapter you could say 18.2 to approximately 48 is karma yoga then 49 to 54 is gyan yoga and then it's bhakti yoga and then krishna says that there's another way to attain this destination and sarva karmanya pisada kurvano madvyapashraya you don't have to go by this you know from karma yoga to gyan yoga to bhakti yoga from wherever you are you can practice bhakti yoga and you can be elevated from whatever point you are and then more or less krishna concludes in 63 when like a doctor may say at the end of a at the end of a comparison of various people now i have described to you now you decide what you want to do now at this point arjuna becomes very pensive very seriously thoughtful no krishna said that in the second chapter krishna said that in the eighth chapter and krishna said that in the 16th chapter now he doesn't think like that because <laughs> when krishna is speaking षडसे अतः द्वितीयो अध्याय अतः पंचादशो अध्याय नो इट्स नेचुरल डिस्कशन बट आजरा सेज ओके ओके कृष्णा सेड दैट ओवर देयर एंड कृष्णा सेड दैट ओवर देयर कृष्णा सेड दैट ओवर देयर एंड देन ही इज लॉस्ट इन थॉट नाउ ही इज लॉस्ट इन थॉट बिकॉज़ ही इज थिंकिंग ओके नॉट जस्ट व्हाट आई शुड डू कृष्णा इज सेइंग डू एज यू डिजायर अर्जुन इज थिंकिंग व्हाट डस कृष्णा वांट मी टू डू Hmm. so and that is the question in his mind so when two people are very close to each other sometimes by their glances itself they can speak volumes hmm. and sometimes when people are upset with each other angry with each other they not close to each other they can speak volumes and not communicate at all <laughs> isn't it <laughs> so here arjuna speaks arjuna doesn't speak anything specifically but arjuna's question is krishna what do you want me to do and it's like uh, the doctor has given various options to the patient and the patient says that you know if say if it had been your child in the situation what treatment would you recommend so it makes it much more personal not just clinical or professional so that is the mood from the 64th verse onwards 64th verse is one of the sweetest verses it is krishna's heart's affection is coming out sarva guhyatamam bhuya shunume paramam vacha ishto sime dudamiti tato vakshami dehitam so till this point you could say krishna is more like a dispassionate educator hmm okay this option these are the pros and cons this option these are the pros and cons but from here onwards krishna his mood is more like a impassioned lover not merely an educator it's you know i love you i care for you drudamiti i am always i'm de- i'm determined to love you i'm determined to care for you it is for your benefit that i'm speaking and then krishna speaks man mana bho mat bhakto and then sarva dharma an pratyaj it's like the doctor saying you just take this treatment if there is any complication i will handle the complication that's like aham tvam sarva papibhyo mokshishami 
so here it's categorically it is bhakti yoga krishna sarva dharma and prithi so obviously we have analyzed various parts and various conception of dharma we have talked about but don't get caught this this is too complex don't get caught in it just do what i am telling you to do aham tvam sarva pape pyo so this is where i said education has two parts make the simple complex or reveal the complexity in the simple and then go from the complex to the simple so 1866 is specifically from the complex to the simple the doctor knows what is a good treatment and if the doctor is saying i will take care of any complications then what more guarantee does a person want so that's why this is considered to be such a powerful verse and then after that of course the falashruti comes and then falashruti is the importance of hearing the bhagavad gita and then krishna asks arjuna have you understood and arjuna says that yes ashto moha smritilabdha and then after that the effect of the gita on sanjay is described and then the gita ends with sanjay indirectly answering the dhritarashtra's indirect question the indirect question was what happened to them what did they do so he says that wherever what did they do means it is it's like a cricket match is going on you know what do the players do the under actual question is who is winning or who is going to win so he says where there's krishna and arjuna that's where there's going to be victory so that's how the gita ends so but in one sense the instructive message of the gita is finished in 1866 so the first instructive word of arjuna is of krishna is in 211 and the last instructive word is in 1866 and if you see the first instructive word is ashochan and the last instructive word is ma shuchaha so if you consider this jiva goswami is very good in analyzing the structure of scripture so jiva goswami based on this analysis he says the purpose of the bhagavad gita is what to free everyone from lamentation ashocha it's not worth lamenting ma shucha do not lament again taking the medical metaphor it's it's a, a doctor a patient is very much i feel i feel i got a terrible disease i got a terrible cancer what is going to happen to me don't worry so much how can i not worry that the doctor explains it's not worth getting so worried about ashocha how is it now the doctor explains and at the end says don't worry so jiva swami says the gita's purpose is to free us all from lamentation and the world will give us many reasons to lament but if we lift our vision to krishna then we won't have to lament now this is the second part i don't have time for the third part but i'll just take two points on the third part that's perspective so many times people have this question prabhupada wrote his commentary and he called it as bhagavad gita as it is and say prabhupada for example the sixth chapter krishna is the shucha udeshe pratishthape sirmas vatmana he say go to the forest and sit in a secluded place and prabhupada say this is not practical in this age we should just chant hari krishna at home so there is one commentator who says look at the audacity of this person he says he is directly contradicting what krishna is saying <laughs> and as if that is not bad enough then he is saying my bhagavad gita is as it is <laughs> so how can he do that so people say this is a bhakti biased commentary but it's not that simple see if prabhupad wanted to give a bhakti biased commentary then prabhupad could have stopped, could have avoided giving the sanskrit isn't it he could have just given us a translation of the commentary but prabhupad see he gives us the sanskrit and he wants us to say sanskrit he gives the sanskrit in the devanagari and he gives it in the transliteration and then he gives us the synonyms also so sometimes krishna is using karma yoga and prabhupad is giving krishna consciousness over there so now that difference is obvious to anyone 
if Prabhupada just wanted to give a bhakti biased commentary, Bhagavad Gita as it is, is it bhakti biased? Well, it's if that's what Prabhupada wanted to do, why did Prabhupada make it so transparent? It's like, you know, say, if you invited me for a program and I didn't come for your program, and you saw that I had gone for some other program and you saw the photos over there, and uh, then I tell you, I couldn't come to your program because I was sick. <laughs> well, then, okay, if you are going to lie to me, at least don't insult my intelligence by speaking an unbelievable lie. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> at least speak a lie that is believable. Isn't it? So, if Prabhupada wanted to give a bhakti bias commentary, why would you give us the transliteration which will all make us see what that, okay, this is Karma Yoga, this is translated Krishna consciousness. What's going on over here? So, Prabhupada is actually aware of the technical flow of the Bhagavad Gita. If you especially see in the last verses of any chapter or the first verses of any, most many chapters, Prabhupada talks about the technical flow of the chapter. So, for example, at the end of the second chapter, Prabhupada says that there is a, this chapter has described Karma Yoga and a hint of Bhakti Yoga has been given. So, second chapter end, Prabhupada is saying, hint of Bhakti Yoga has been given over here. Now, that hint of Bhakti Yoga is actually in 2.61. Mai Tani Sarvani Sanyamya Yukta Asita Mat Paraha. The B is the second part of the four lines. That is where the Bhakti Yoga, Mamat Para, that Mat is only mentioned over there. Vishwanath Chaitakur said this is the first drop of Bhakti in the Bhagavad Gita. But Prabhupada in his purport has not given a hint of Bhakti. He has like given the full movie of Bhakti. Savai Manaha Krishna Padaravinda. He is describing about Abu Ambarish Maharaj using all his limbs in Krishna's service. So, Prabhupada is aware of what is going in the Bhagavad Gita and Prabhupada is making a conscious decision. What is his decision? Prabhupada says in a lecture that you know, I want that if people read any page of my book, they should get the essential message. They should get that Krishna is God and we are meant to serve him. So it is in one sense, we analyze to some extent that there is an intricate flow of the Bhagavad Gita which culminates in Bhakti Yoga. So, what Prabhupada, this is, this is the Gita. And if you consider the Bhagavad Gita as it is, what happens is, what is given in the conclusion that Prabhupada gives throughout the Gita. So, Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita is not Bhakti biased. See, the Gita is itself bhakti conclusive. It's very clear in its conclusion that you cannot have a more clear conclusion than Sarva Dharman Parityajamami Kam Sharanam Braj. Some people say, Oh, Krishna is speaking that for the bhaktas. Does Krishna say that I am speaking this for the bhaktas? It's like Krishna says, Sarva Dharman Parityaj. He's not saying that. Okay, Sarva Dharma and Pratija, except for Gyanis, Yogis, Karma Yogis, Bhakti and Dhyan Yogis. For all of them, no. Sarva, it's a very categorical statement. The Bhagavad Gita is itself Bhakti conclusive. Now, Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita commentary is Bhakti centered. It is not Bhakti biased. Bhakti centered means Prabhupada, out of his compassion, what is he doing? That which is given in the conclusion, Prabhupada is giving throughout the Gita. And in that way, he wants to make sure that we don't get lost in the technical flow of the Gita. And in getting lost in technical flow, we should not miss out on the conclusion. So that's his compassion. And his compassion is not coming at the expense of transparency. The transparency, as I said, is there because he's giving the Sanskrit transliteration and uh, Devanagari and everything. So, Prabhupada's, Prabhupada himself said, that among the, when we made a list of future books that he wanted to write, he said that one of the books he said is Bhagavad Gita. 
the devotees told him that Prabhupada you have already written. But see, there are so many Acharya's commentaries. I can write from other Acharya's commentary perspective. So Prabhupada could have delved into the technical flow of the Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada was aware of it, but Prabhupada chose a conscious strategy to make sure that the conclusion is apparent for everyone. And he has given us the legacy of wisdom. His connected was with the scripture and with the tradition. So we can relish the nectar of the Bhagavad Gita by the mercy of Srila Prabhupada. And if we can, if we have the interest and the intelligence to appreciate the technical flow, we can definitely do that. But even if we can't or don't want to do that, still we can relish the bhakti conclusion. And thus, we don't miss out on what Krishna takes Arjuna to ultimately. So that is the perspective that the Bhagavad Gita, the, or the Bhagavad Gita that Prabhupada takes. Prabhupada is bhakti-centered. Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita is as it is in the sense that the conclusion is given as it is. The conclusion is consistently emphasized as it is. So I'll summarize what we discussed today. I talked about three broad terms. The first was, do you remember? Purpose. purpose. So we discussed that Krishna's purpose is not to go about in the technical analysis of various yoga paths. It's more of Arjuna's options or renunciation or action. And Krishna expands those options by talking about four levels, like mature renunciation, immature renunciation, then attached action and detached action. And in that connection, Krishna analyzes various paths. So associated with this, there is there is Dhyan Yoga and Gyan Yoga. Then detached action associated with this, there are two paths. There is Bhakti Yoga and there is Karma Yoga. And then there is Karma Kanda. And we discussed in terms of Krishna's recommendation. This is definitely no. 4, 3, 2 and 1. And then we discussed the purpose of Krishna is, is like an archer. He wants to get Arjuna to fight. Because that's what is required for the purpose of dharma. And Krishna is the expert archer who can hit the same target from multiple directions. So Krishna is not interested. The yoga ladder in the Bhagavad Gita is not so much a ladder itself. It's yoga talked about from different perspectives for one purpose. So whether it is karma kanda, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, jnana yoga or dhyan yoga. Now, it is of course a ladder and that ladder we discuss in terms of progression. It is if you consider the 18 chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, it is 1 to 6 is a progression from Karma Yoga through Dhyan Yoga to Bhakti Yoga. Then six to, to 7 to 12 is Bhakti Yoga itself. And then Gyan Yoga to Bhakti Yoga is the last 6 chapters. And this progression is based on how the subject develops. So this, if you consider here the okay, the progression that is based on the flow is primarily it's Arjuna's questions that are driving the flow of the Gita. And Arjuna's questions are related to the discussion itself and broadly related to the worldview, the broad topic or the worldview. So these kind of questions especially come from chapter 11 onwards. And then lastly, the, the perspective that Shri Prabhupada has, it's not, it's, it's not bhakti biased. It's not bhakti biased, it is Bhakti centered. The Gita itself is Bhakti conclusive. So, some people say the Gita teaches different paths for different people. Well, yes and no. Yes, the Gita does talk about if somebody wants to be at the Karma Yoga level, they can be at that level. See, the Bhagavad Gita is inclusive. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, dismiss Karma Yoga. It does dismiss 
immature renunciation. It doesn't dismiss or deman demonize or devalue karma yoga or jnana yoga or dhyan yoga. But it clearly recommends. So the Gita is inclusive and it is, it is, it is not inconclusive. It is inclusive but not inconclusive. It has a very clear conclusion. And can, can somebody take the Bhagavad Gita to talk about Karma Yoga? Definitely they can. But if they say that Bhagavad Gita's conclusion is Karma Yoga, then they have to force their words on Krishna's words. Because Sarva Dharma and Paritaja, there are many words, many verses like that where Krishna is saying, this is the highest knowledge I am giving you. So in that way, what Prabhupada is giving is the highest conclusion of the Gita made accessible for everyone very easily. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.